It's a hundred years since Prince Borghese and four other drivers raced 8,000 miles from China to France, and we are with 130 antique cars trying to do it again. Their owners have paid 35,000 pounds each to enter, and the race stops every night like the Tour de France. We're following five video diarists. There are the Itala boys, their car's a load of trouble, but Adam and Jonathan would sooner laugh than cry. The Geordie lads, Joe is a television chef and Bob has a pub. He bought the pub after being banned from it. There are the Aussies, Andrew invited his dad to drive him to Paris and here they are. There are the two fast ladies, Pamela likes the accelerator, Nicola prefers the brake. And there's baby driver, Petite Michelle from Manhattan. She's with Dan from the Midwest. Michelle's the driver, and that's the way she likes it. And I'm Jack Pitsy, and I'm on the race, trying to understand what's going on. When Prince Borghese got to these parts, he was well ahead of the field and he faced a bit of a problem. Though in a way, the problem was also a solution. What happened was that the Trans-Siberian Railway had only recently been built and that meant that people had stopped using the roads and they'd been allowed to fall into complete disrepair. They were unusable. So he couldn't drive, so what was he going to do? Well, he was an ingenious man. He looked at the railway and thought, that's it. And they tried getting the car up onto the railway tracks and they found they could do it. Now he was a man of great influence, Borghese, and it wasn't long before he'd been on to all the right officials and he'd had the car actually scheduled into the railway timetable and that's how he made it along the railway. It's another frontier. We're about to leave rugged, primitive, bone-shaking, car-breaking, yet inspiring, awesome and delightful Mongolia. It's not surprising that classic cars haven't raced across Mongolia since Borghese did it a hundred years ago. It's time to say goodbye to Mongolian border guards and hello to the Russian ones. No one has seen the Atala boys and their car number two since they broke down back in the Gobi Desert. Since then, they've slept out alone, they've had more experience than most with the locals, and they've managed to truck their crippled car to city after city and garage after garage. And finally, somewhere in Russia, they bought an old Volga car and found some mechanics who squeezed the Volga's engine into the Atala. And now, at last, the Itolga, as they call the result, is about to rejoin the rally. Clubs. Yeah. Had a few problems with the car, and here we are. In time for dinner, I hope. Come on, this is what we want to see now. We left the lights on. <laughs> this is just great. We got this from a scrapyard. Hey. Look at it. Hey. 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 Yeah. With an alternator. It's a Wolski motor now. Is it turbocharged? Let's go. Modern carburetor and all sorts of things. What's your motor? Russian, 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 Russian quality. Russian motor. Yeah, Russian quality. Russian quality. Crankshaft broke. Crankshaft broke. And the timing gear. Yeah. And the water pump seized. But apart from that, everything was fine. What's the chance? As Colin Valls. For a few hours, we're here in Omsk. Prince Borghese and the Atala were here for a good deal longer. 
In the short time we have, just four things to tell you about Omsk. First, the place is plagued with midges everywhere. Second, they have a sense of humour here. There are a lot more like her around. Third, Dostoevsky was in prison here. Crime and punishment. Poor Dostoevsky. His crime was to speak his mind, and his punishment was to be imprisoned here and flogged till he almost died. And fourth, Borghese. He had a great consignment of spares delivered here in huge crates. Now, he claimed that they didn't arrive in time, but police and customs men here said that they did arrive, that he paid 700 francs duty on them, and that while he was here, the Italic was completely rebuilt, that it left Omsk a new car. In the summer, Siberia is not what the name suggests. It's actually mild and very green. But it does rain a lot, as the Aussies in their Holden are finding. It's been raining for the past 100 kilometers, and this is what's happened. One wiper, no wiper. Dad's wiper fell off, so that's his problem. Mine's still going. Well, shit happens. It's as simple as that. Never in my 40 odd years of driving has a windscreen wiper flown off as it's been wiping. <laughs> but, um, you know, suddenly you know, you're driving along and uh, you can see the wipers are working, and, and then the next minute, bloody nothing. The fucking thing just flew off. Yeah, well, uh, and I asked Dad, I said, Dad, what happened to the two original ones? Where are they? Back home in the shed, he said. We're still rolling across Siberia, and the next stop is the town of Tayumen, with a bright banner outside a drab hotel. One distinction of this town, Tayumen, is that Lenin spent the Second World War here. He was long dead, of course but they moved his embalmed body here from Moscow because Moscow was deemed to be too close to the enemy. Lenin, communism. Puts you in mind of the British politician who came to Russia in the very early days of communism and said, I've seen the future and it works. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Outside our crumbling hotel, Mick takes us on a guided tour. The place has a glum Soviet feel to it. As you can see, beautifully paved, and looked after landscaping here. Beautiful young lady going off to work. And uh, some washing on the line here. We really don't know when that's going to dry. But you can only hope. Children's playground here. Now let's go and have a look at it to see what these poor little buggers have to contend with. I see a bit of a sand pit there, uh, some swings, seesaws, monkey bars, a swing. Oh, and what have we here? Oh, we've got lumps of concrete, no doubt, for the future kids of the Russian Olympic weightlifting team to practice on. There's no racing while we're in Russia, no time trials, because the Kremlin says Nyet. Occasionally we see a village where the houses look pretty much as they did when Borghese came through a hundred years ago.
In 1907, when Prince Borghese came through here, the Tsar was still on the throne, the Tsar of all the Russias. He must have been a bit of a car buff, because here he is with one of his Rolls Royces. And who knows, it's quite possible that that car might be on the rally with us now. Ten years later, in 1917, came the Russian Revolution. Now, at that time, this church had not been built. On this site, there was a house. And in the cellar of that house, the Tsar and his family were in hiding. They were found and brutally executed. They were shot and clubbed to death with rifle butts, and their bodies were dumped down a mine shaft. There must have been remorse in Russia, because soon after communism ended, they built the Church of the Spilt Blood here on the site of the massacre. And what do the girls do when you open your trousers? Volga. Volga. We sing a nice song about the Itolga. Itala, Volga. Itolga. Itolga. Praise be to the Itolga. Volga, Volga, my Tradamaya. Volga, my Tushkirika. That evening, we're in the town of Kazan. The local girls are smoking what we're told is dried apple shavings, and we're sticking carefully to beer. Next morning, there's just time for a glimpse of the town's World Heritage-listed Kremlin buildings, unless, that is, you've got to fix your car. This is the sixth time that I have changed or taken my clutch out in a week. There was one man who bought himself a fine classic car to enter the race and then phoned the rally director to ask if it would run on diesel or petrol. He was warned off. To keep going on this event, you really have to know your tappets from your big end. Roll bar, pull on the roll bar. <laughs> That's that. Didn't you fall again? That stopwatch, yes. There we are. <laughs> By the end of day 21, we're arriving in Nizhny Novgorod and parking up beneath a statue of Lenin. He'd be happy to see the bourgeoisie doing manual work like the proletariat. There he is, still dominating the scene from our hotel windows. Back in the 70s, I was a cub reporter, and I was sent to interview a Marxist-Leninist union leader in England. And at the time, there were many strikes. They were paralyzing the country. It became known as the winter of discontent. And there was a three-day week. And I asked this union leader the obvious question. If you go on like this, aren't you going to bring us to a standstill, bring us down? And he said, and I've never forgotten this, that is what we call the coming collapse of capitalism, and it is inevitable. Well, as we now know, of course, Soviet communism lasted barely 70 years. Hours behind us, Michelle and Dan's car is getting some professional attention. We don't know what's going to happen. It could take an hour to fix. It could take four hours to fix. It could not be fixed tonight. We might have to sleep in town, or we might have to put it on a truck. And for me, the last thing I want to do is put it on a truck. So anything that we have to do, uh, you know, I'm willing to do. So our new friends here have just toasted us and made us drink vodka and um, <laughs> unknown meat. Oh, I think Dan's trying to give him money and he's refusing. Okay, so this in here is the battery. You can see the whole floor is pulled up. And here is our new 
brand new battery. And this is hopefully, if all goes well, what is going to get us to Paris. And of course, more Russian vodka. France. 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 Yeah. Okay. I encourage Dan to drink the vodka because I think he's Please. going to need it. <laughs> Next morning, someone else has been on the vodka. Found the young Andrew in our car. Yeah. He got on the slops last night. And he's not a well boy this morning. <laughs> not a well boy at all. And I just hope that he doesn't bloody send us back to Mongolia. <laughs> Very, very bad. <laughs> That's putting it politely. <laughs> what happened? Well, I, we got to the hotel last night. Oh, it would have been about, around about 10 o'clock-ish. I uh, had a beer here before we jumped on the bus. Um, had a beer at the uh, hotel and, and sat down and had dinner. And uh, then Dad pissed off and I had another beer and a shot of vodka with the competitors and chatted up a bit of the bit of the nightlife and went to bed at about 1. Mm -hmm. Woke up this morning all right about 5.30, knocked on Dad's door for some soap, <laughs> had a spew, <laughs> had a crap, had a shower and a shave, went outside, had a spew, <laughs> washed my teeth again, jumped on the bus, came here, sat in the car, went to sleep, had a spew <laughs> and had a coffee and now I'm doing the maths for today. Your father doesn't seem too sorry for you. No, he doesn't, no. no. <laughs>
After we've eaten Joe's delicious meal, I've got a question about something that Prince Borghese did a hundred years ago. Right, tomorrow we all take off from Moscow, and um, Paris is that way, but we're going that way. We're going to St. Petersburg, and that's what Borghese did. So what I want to know is, if you were leading a really important race and you were here in Moscow and tomorrow you were going on, would you go out of your way towards St. Petersburg for about 600 miles? Answer? <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> Come on, it's tomorrow, you're taking off. All these people are behind you, it's really important. Would you make this big diversion? Um, well, my understanding is that he uh, made the diversion to attend a ball in St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. is what, what I have read. Um, so, yeah, in order to attend a... a formal ball after driving through Mongolia, I would. Yes. You would? Absolutely. You'd risk throwing the race in order to, for a chance to wear that dress? Absolutely. Great. <laughs> Nikki, what about you? Well, I think if I was in the situation that Borghese was in at the time, he had 12 days in hand, he had a huge amount of support and the means to get what he wanted when he needed it, and there was a lot of rumours about him having spare parts waiting for him all the way the line and he also did the dirty on people in the Gobi where there was a gentle disagreement that all, they would all wait each other, see them through the desert and they'll help each other along. He broke that agreement when he was first to go. He was arrogant enough and strong enough that he had the confidence to know that when he was 12 days ahead he could still get to Petersburg, have a jolly good time doing whatever he wanted to do and still win the race because he had the means and the whereby and he was determined and confident enough that he could do that. Lovely. Sorry, Jack. Uh, what would you have done? I said, given who he was... Uh, Paris. Uh, yeah. Because, well, uh, if I was trying to win something, I'd have, I wouldn't have wasted any time going anywhere else. No, I would have gone to Paris. Uh, but yeah. what would it say, why would you have gone to St. Petersburg? Well, that's where there are all sorts of theories. You know, there are people who say that if you look at photographs of the car before and after St. Petersburg, it's different. Um, yeah, you cars. Yeah, yeah. And may maybe St. Petersburg was a place where a new car could be shipped in. Yeah on the water, who knows, but it's, I do think it seems a pretty odd decision. We'll come back to Borghese, but in the next program we start racing again, and one of our video diarists comes a bit unstuck.